You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. I got a bonus episode for you today. I recently interviewed Justine Carino on the Anxiety Podcast, and then she interviewed me on her podcast, which is called Thoughts from the Couch. And I do this from time to time where I share the other interview. So basically me being interviewed, it's me telling my story. Um, I think it's, it's some useful stuff in there. If you've already heard my story, I think Justine is a great interviewer and she pulls out some extra bits and insights which I haven't touched on before. So please do have a listen. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Here we go. Hi, Tim. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Can you tell my audience a little bit more about yourself and where you're tuning in from? Where do I start? Um, I'm currently tuning in from uh, Vancouver Island, um, but I uh, grew up on a different island. Um, in the Atlantic, I grew up in uh, in England in the UK. So, yeah, at some point in my mid to late twenties, I moved to Canada and um, have been here ever since. What's the weather like today out in Vancouver Island? Today is beautiful, but generally speaking, it's uh, pretty similar to English weather, um, which is very changeable. Sometimes raining, and you wait five minutes, and the clouds blow over, and it's sunny again. But um, today is nice. I'll take it. And uh, actually, in the UK, which I'm off to for a trip this weekend, they've had like ridiculously high um, temperatures. I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit, but 40 Celsius, which is very, it's unheard of for the UK. Yeah. Yeah. Right now in the US, it well, in the Northeast, I'm in New York, it's been a heat wave. So it's like high 90s, like 95, 96, 97 Fahrenheit, which is like pretty crazy right now. People aren't happy. I've been in, uh, I lived in Manhattan for three months, one summer, many years ago. And I I come in from England where we don't have that type of humidity. I was just like, at the time I was working in a corporate office environment, I was walking to work and I was like, I'm just going to, my whole shirt is like see-through by the time I get to work. It's like wet through. So I'd have to go into like, go into like a department store just to stand under the air condition and then carry on again. (laughs) Totally relatable. Yes. Those working in Manhattan in the summers are usually drenched. So it's nice to get the blast of AC. Yes. Well, thank you so much for joining me. You know, I love your podcast. um, And I would love for you to share with my audience your anxiety story. So when did you first realize anxiety was a strong emotion in your life that was negatively impacting you in in your daily living? Yeah, I think that um, I always had anxiety, but it wasn't until it really became at the forefront of my life in terms of, you know, I think as a sensitive person and somebody who's um, a high achiever and maybe works too much sometimes. Um, I sort of buried it with other things. And now looking back with sort of hindsight, I look at my childhood and I was like, oh yeah, I was, you know, a bit sensitive and cared a lot about what people thought and all those types of traits, which we now associate with anxiety, anxious people. Um, but I kind of equate it to sort of like a, a volcano. And I think for most of my life, it had just been this sort of river of lava running under the surface sort of unseen above the you know above the crust but a big event which happened in my mid 30s sort of made it come out and once it erupted it was then like it it wouldn't stop you know it became the biggest thing in my life and it stayed like that for some time that's so interesting and what I say to a lot of people is like sometimes we have it in our DNA right sometimes we're predisposed for anxiety Um, and the environment turns those genes on. And now we see this volcano eruption, like you're describing, like it's been dormant. There are little clues or traits throughout your life, but to really feel that explosion of the anxiety symptoms, the way you're describing it makes such sense. Cause sometimes it's the, a time in our life that really triggers those genes to go off. Mm. Yeah. And for me, like I'll, I'll share that particular story just cause it's interesting, but, um, I kind of created like a perfect storm for anxiety is the way I think of it. So I traveled from um, the UK, sorry, from Canada to the back to the UK for a business trip. And uh, when I arrived, I did what all English people do, which is uh, that's, that's a 
very stereotypical thing to say, but <laughs> I went to the pub and started drinking because I, you know, catching up with some old friends, having a few beers, which turned into too many drinks and probably like a early morning, one or 2 a.m. finish. <laughs> I knew I had to do a presentation the next morning, but I'd done it so many times over the years. It was kind of like, a, you know, in, in some business circles, it's like a badge of honor, right? You go out and have a big night and then you just get up and, you know, get on with it. Yeah. Um, so I got up to it with a view to get getting on with it and uh did my usual double espresso and got on the train and went to this other building. And um, yeah, I felt hungover and I felt like crap. But again, I'd done it before. And I it I made an episode about this the other day, which is kind of like the in England we call it a seesaw. In the US, you call it a, a teeter-totter. I can't do the <laughs> accent, but <clears throat> the I think sometimes depending on where your mental state is at, anxiety can take you one way or the other. And in that case, it wasn't something which kind of led to more excitement and, and euphoria. It was like these feelings made me more self-conscious than ever. And as I launched into this presentation, which I'd done, you know, dozens of times before, I, you know, that hungover feeling and then the just the pressure of having to perform on the spot, I had this you know, the, the M and M moment where I choked and I couldn't get, get, get any words out. Mm -hmm. And I looked, I turned around and looked at my, <clears throat> looked at my screen of uh, notes. And then I looked back at the audience and they're all like, yeah, we'll see. When's he going to start? I did that a couple of times. Then I was just like, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't carry on. And in, inside me, all these emotions are going on where, um, I felt like I had vertigo, like I was going to fall over and pass out. I felt my heart started getting really tight. Like I was going to have a heart attack. I had like pressure in my head, like all these started to sweat really quickly in about 15 seconds, all this stuff happened. And I, and I, you know, for those of you listening, who've had anxiety, it's like, um, it, it's just getting progressively worse basically. And, and I couldn't, I was paralyzed, you know, in, in the animal kingdom of fight, flight or freeze, I was in like a freeze state. I was just like, you know, the deer in the headlights. And it, eventually with enough staring from people in the audience, I just said, sorry, I got to go to the toilet. I don't feel well. So that was my get out of jail free card. Um, so it, in hindsight, it's kind of somewhat interesting because I was in a high security tech building and I couldn't just get out. You had to get somebody's key card to scan into the next oh, area. No. So I couldn't, I couldn't even leave. I had to go You're and ask stuck. somebody, excuse me, I need a toilet. Can I go? And they said, yeah, here you go. Here's my key card. So I went in the bathroom and it's so weird going from like a normal life, like everything's fine to like end of world doom thinking happened in a space of minutes. Now I'm standing in front of the mirror in the bathroom, splashing water on my face. And in my head, I'm like, oh no, that's it. People are now going to find out or the secret I've been hiding all along, which is like, I'm not good enough to do this. I'm not worthy. And, um, I started thinking now I'm going to lose my job and then I'll lose my house. And then my wife will leave me. My kids won't want me as their dad anymore. Like literally straight to the end of the depths very fast. But somewhere in all that noise, I thought to myself, I can't leave this room and not go back in there. I have to go back in there. They're still sat there in my mind. I'm like, pick all the one side of my head, all this stuff's running through it. And the other side, I'm thinking that I got to go back and do my thing. They're waiting. So now I look back on myself with sort of like a bit more gentle, loving kindness and think like it was very brave to do what I did next, which was I went back in the room and I said to the people, look, I don't know what's wrong. And I've talked about that before as well, where I feel like anxieties in some cases, like that makes you very honest. It would have been much easier for me to lie and say like, I'm sorry, I got the flu or I got food poisoning. It would have been an eat, but for some reason I didn't, I almost wanted to tell them, like I, I said, I don't know what's wrong. I was speaking the absolute truth. Like I don't know what's wrong with me. This is very strange but I'm going to do my best to carry on. If you don't mind, I'm going to do it sitting down because I feel like I'm going to fall over. So that was that. And I, and so every word coming out of my mouth was a struggle. And, and again, for people who've experienced anxiety, you know what this feels like, but it was kind of like, I felt like I was going to fail again at any moment. It was going to be the same again where I couldn't continue. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I managed to scrape through that. And uh, afterwards, obviously lots of people came up to me and said, are you all right? Are you all right? And, uh, for the rest of that day, I was just so out of sorts. I felt like I was kind of watching myself from a distance, like spaced out. And, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't tell if I needed to go to the, go to the toilet or not. Like my body wasn't reading signals properly. It was so like sensitized and like, 
you know, um, on edge. The, the anxiety in my stomach was so high that I couldn't, I didn't know if I was hungry or not. I didn't know if I needed to go for a pee or not. It was like nothing really was registering. So went back to my hotel room that night and, uh, you know, continued that down the doom sort of trail. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was scary. I felt like ending it all to be honest and go in from like the 24 hours prior, I mean, I friends and everything's fine to like thinking about killing myself, uh, was, was a very short time frame. And they, yeah. I've heard that before where people go from like, everything's fine to ending their lives in very short amounts of time. And that I can see how that would happen in that case. Um, I didn't, and, uh, I just cried on my bed and, uh, eventually fell asleep and, um, then just sort of struggled through for a long time. That's kind of, that was how it all started. Um, interestingly, the one thing I regret is, um, I was in back in England again, and all I really wanted in that moment was my mum, right? Mm. As a, as a 35, 36 year old man, all I wanted was my mum, And I could have phoned her up the next morning and said, mom, I'm struggling, need help. I'll get on the train, come to your house. And she would have, you know, taking care of me as she always does. Yeah. I didn't because I was just too ashamed, right? You just didn't feel so I mean, anxiety's definitely destigmatized over the last few years because of what we've all collectively been through. But back then I still felt like ashamed and and very weak for experiencing that whole thing. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I know a lot of people listening have probably had moments like this. Um, and, you know, I work with a lot of clients that come in my office telling very similar stories. So I appreciate you being so open and vulnerable. There's some tidbits from your story that I'm like, ooh, I want to go back to this. So mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. Like you gave us some clues of what set you up for this moment that day. So one was the drinking, right? So I mean, we all love to have a drink here and there, but Unfortunately, our drinking messes with everything else in our system and it can actually end up making people feel more anxious, right? So when we are initially drinking, we get that nice buzz, we feel good, we can be really social, it loosens up our inhibitions. A lot of people with social anxiety, side note, um, like that beginning because it helps them become a little bit more chatty in social situations. Um, but as the alcohol then starts to withdraw from your system, it becomes a depressant and it can trigger depression and anxiety. So during that during that withdrawal period of the alcohol going through your blood system and leaving, people tend to be more anxious. And that's why a lot of people, when they wake up on the weekends with hangovers, they're anxious just because their nervous system is responding that way. But they're also anxious like, what did I do? What did I say? Should I be mm. embarrassed? Should I be ashamed of whatever? So that was one thing I picked up on to like lack of sleep. Right. So for listeners, I'm just picking out the things here that can set us up for anxiety at times. Um, if we don't get enough sleep, our brain isn't fully rested and sleep is highly correlated with anxiety. Right. The way sleep helps nurture that limbic system and the executive functioning part of our brain. When we lose sleep, that communication's off and it's a lot harder to regulate our emotions. Um, so those are two things that kind of set you up for it. And then the caffeine. Right. So. Mm -hmm caffeine. So then we treat it with the caffeine, which spikes the heart rate, which can mimic anxiety symptoms. So there's like three things already going on before you even stepped in that room that kind of set you up for this moment. Um, and then you really highlighted the catastrophizing that was going on in your mind, right? I love how you shared that. You were like, I left the room and then I went into this thought spiral of, every worst case scenario. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my wife. I'm going to lose my kids. I've just ruined my whole life. So that thought spiral is very common for a lot of people struggling with anxiety. And we call it catastrophizing, which is one of the cognitive distortions that we see people with anxiety commonly have. You know, really taking one piece of evidence and assuming the worst because of it and then believing it. Like you truly believe that your wife's going to leave you and you're going to lose your job and your kids. So then no wonder you're feeling depressed and suicidal at that point. Mm -hmm. And thank you for sharing that too, this moment of deep despair and, and suicidal thoughts that resulted so quickly for you. Um, what was it like after that day? What did I anxiety kind of look like for you after that day? Um, then, you know, it was kind of like a switch had been flipped on and it was kind of like, just on, it was like, 
on all the time. So I, I still had to be there for another few days for work, which I sort of struggled through. But the whole time I was on edge of, you know, is this going to happen again? What if it happens again? I mean, that's kind of like the narrative that's running through your mind for, for some years after the fact is like, what if it happens again in this situation when I'm talking to my kid's teacher or when I'm presenting in my back in my office or speaking to the CEO or, you know, and, and when my anxiety was bad, it was kind of like, I'd be sat, in the living room with my kids watching cartoons on a Saturday morning and feeling like anxious. And I was like, I've got no reason to feel threatened or worried or anything, but it was just the fl- the switch had been flipped. And so the, the immediate response was I went back home and went to the doctors, which is what you do when something was wrong with you and, and saw the doctor and the doctor just sort of um, didn't ask me about any of the surrounding issues they didn't say well have you been in a travel and alcohol caffeine nothing like that they just said well probably uh you know something to do with um chemical imbalance or something's just off and so she span around in her chair and grabbed a box of pills and said take these for a couple of weeks and see how you get on and if those don't work we'll give you something else and uh, it should be good i said that's it she said yeah that's it <laughs> so i went home intuitively thinking that isn't it but um i i took the the pills for a couple of days and then i said to my wife like this just feels wrong it's actually making me feel worse because now i'm putting stuff in my body and i don't know if it's going to make me feel worse and on the box of the pills it says make people suicidal thoughts i'm like bloody hell that's what i'm trying to get away from (laughs) Um, yeah so i stopped taking them and i know uh that 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 type of medication like ssris take like uh, yeah. a couple of weeks to start working anyway. Like it yeah. takes time for it to get into your system. So, um, so then I kind of like, uh, after some months, I, I, I actually met with a, a coach that I used to work with around that time. And I said to him, like, is, do you think my, my, uh, life is making me anxious or am I just like broken? Am I just an anxious person? And he said, well, you know, he's in a, in a very short amount of words. He just said, well, why don't you change your life and see what happens? And I was like, I love that. Wow. That's uh, <laughs> interesting. So one by one over the next um, sort of few, maybe over the course of six months, I left my job. You know, I got myself into a, a very common situation for, for people, which is that I had um, bought a big house and put my kids in private school and, and, you know, acreage in the country, two brand new cars, all the, these golden handcuffs of like trappings of consumerism where I needed to create, you know, X of tens of thousands of dollars a month to like pay for all this stuff. And, uh, and so I couldn't just quit my job because I got, the, then I got this bill. So I had to make some wholesale changes. So I sat, sat down with my wife and I said, look, I can't keep doing this. We need to move. We need to change. We need to do things. So it was, it was significant in that I left my job, um, I did start working on a different project of real estate type investing to, uh, which interestingly introduced me to some of the people that were useful in my recovery, but um, took the kids out of private school, sold our house, moved to a different, moved from Toronto to where I am now, Vancouver Island. So a, a whole lifestyle change. Cause I was like, well, where do I really want to be? I want to live by the ocean and mountains and beautiful scenery and stuff is going to be better for my soul. So yeah. So I, I, you know, changed my diet, left my job, started going to CrossFit, moved cities and, and, um, I'm not doing CrossFit anymore, but I'll tell you what, like that first six months of doing it, like was exactly what I needed at the time to get like, you know, that nervous energy out every, you know, five times a week with a community of people was amazing. Um, my shoulders don't agree long-term, but <laughs> for a while it was good. But yeah, and that's why now when I come to people uh, or people say to me either through the podcast uh, or just people I meet in the world and they say like, I'm, I'm feeling anxious, you know, what's the solution? I, I, I'm, you know, I almost take a step back and say, well, tell me about your life. Like, that's, I feel like I'm a detective, right? I'm like, tell me about, you know, what do you do for work and what's your family and what's your relationships like and, and what do you do for fun and what do you eat and where do you live? It's just everything, you know? Sometimes obviously there are acute PTSD scenarios, somebody just comes back from war. Well, we don't need like Sherlock Holmes to solve that one. It's probably because they've seen horrific things and they can't yeah. stop. Um, but for a lot of us now, particularly with the pandemic, I think this low level of anxiety is like, you know, what are we worried about happening? Um, 
And a big thing I, I, I often think about this analogy, which I kind of created is if you think about driving a car, if one day your steering wheel starts shaking and you take your car to the, to the shop, to the mechanic, well, the mechanic doesn't sell you a new steering wheel and say, there you go. Now you're fine. The mechanic does the diagnostics, right? They're like, well, your suspension's not proper and you haven't pumped up the air in your tires. Actually, some of these tires need replacing, the alignment's off, et cetera. And then once they fix all those things, the steering wheel doesn't shake anymore. And for me, that alignment in our lives is what anxiety is like for some of us, which is all of the complexity of who we are. The the anxious symptoms are just the, they're the result. They're like the tip of the iceberg. It's all the depth of things that are going on, which create that feeling. I, I really love this part of your story because I can't tell you how many people I meet that um, don't want to take a look at the lifestyle changes. They're really resistant because it's hard. And some people are quick to, to use medication. Um, some people need the medication in addition to the lifestyle change, right? Mm. There's a variety of this, but you're right. I always prefer people to look at lifestyle changes first. And sometimes they're just minimal. Like you need to exercise a little more. You need to sleep a little bit more, blah, blah, blah. But there's also big lifestyle changes that people need to make. And they're so unwilling to do so because they're so afraid. And I love that you mentioned these golden handcuffs. You know, a lot of people get stuck in the way they've created their lifestyle and they want to keep up with it. And they feel like a failure if they pull back or make financial changes. What an amazing thing you did for yourself and your family to to make those changes. What do you think helped you take that leap and like suck up the pride and be like, okay, I kind of have to sell this house now and think about the financial situation in order for me to feel better. What do you think helped with that? I think it was just the fact that I thought I can't keep living with this pain every day like drive my commute was like an hour and and a bit into the office in my car and and i just sit there like panicking the whole way there and then panicking the whole way home like every day it was like so i was like i'm killing myself like i felt like i was like taking years off of my life by being that worried about what does everybody think and what happens at work and i would then start like manipulating my life to avoid situations that could so i changed my role within the company to say i'm not going to be the vp of sales anymore Maybe I'll just be in charge of VP of partner relationships. So then I can pretend I'm doing all this strategic stuff and really I'm just hiding in an office. Um, But yeah, I would avoid all these situations. And it was just like, it's so painful to like not live your truth and be honest. And I think even for me, a part of it is like representing a company. And uh, not that this company was particularly, it wasn't, they weren't doing anything bad, but representing a a product or a company that isn't really aligned with me and I don't really care about, I'm too sensitive for that. It just doesn't, you know, so I think for some people, if they're out there, you know, to use an extreme example, you're an account manager for Philip Morris selling tobacco products to people. Maybe that makes you feel bad because you know, it's not really good. And there's lots of corporate versions of people, companies that are just interested in making money and not interested in people, but there, there was a cost associated with that. And I'm just naturally a, a sort of driven type A person who is also a massive action taker. And I was just like, I got to take massive action on myself. I got to go big on these things and I'll do whatever it takes to feel better. And obviously some of the things like the exercise and the food have changed and evolved over time. But I was like, I'm not drinking alcohol for a period of time till I've solved this. I'm not drinking coffee. Like it wasn't that like, Oh, once in a while I'll have a little, you know, cafe latte. I was like, no, it's over. Like it's, it's dead to me. I'm not having any of that until I'm recovered or healed or whatever that looks like, whatever that feels like. And that was some years I was just like, I'm not, not putting myself in that position. It's just not worth it to me. And so, you know, I think that's, you know, part of the message to my internal psyche is like, I'm investing all this effort. You are worth it. And we're going to, and we're going to fix this. We're going to solve it. I mean, there's lots of reasons to not do it. In at that time, in my real estate investing business, I was like buying properties in in the Toronto area, and I had partners who were investing money with me. And you know, when I said to my wife, like, changing cities is too hard, right? Because I got all these people who rely on me, and she's like, no, just tell them you're going, and if they don't like it, they can buy you out and 
you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's what I did. I just said, I'm going anyway. So either let me manage it remotely or uh, buy me out or whatever it is, but I'm, I got to go. So I get that some people are in, um, in situations financially where they have amazing jobs or the perceived idea of amazing jobs that pay a lot of money. But if that wealth accumulation uh, becomes more prominent than your own health, then there's no point in having loads of money if you're dead or you're having a heart attack or you're, you know, massively overweight because you just sit down all day and you don't move enough. Like, so, you know, I lost 40 pounds in weight just by making that switch because I started working out and changed my food. I wasn't taking people out to drinks and dinner every night like I used to in my old job. And all of those cumulative things like had, um, had a big, big impact, but you know, now, and I know for some people they won't do it. I mean, it's the same reason why people have toxic relationships with family and friends because they're like, I can't stop talking to my brother. Yeah, you can. Yeah, it's, it might be can. uncomfortable, might be awkward, but it's, for your own self-preservation, absolutely. See ya. <laughs> like I would. Exactly. Um, that's just, you just have to put yourself first. I know that people always talk about putting on your own oxygen mask first. It's a good, uh, a good analogy because the people you see most suffering are the ones where their physical and mental health isn't being nurtured or prioritized they don't prioritize their own mental health over other people dumping on them and toxic relationships and it's like yeah well you you you're getting exactly what you're giving yourself and i hear you really tapping into values to make that decision right you you realize i don't value the big house and the fancy cars and the private school as much as i value my own physical and mental health and in order for me um to take care of myself, to show up for myself and my wife and my kids, I have to take care of myself and I have to get uncomfortable with giving up the fancy job and the income to really um, work on this because life with anxiety was torturous for you. Um, and you, I'm guessing, feel so much better in the new life you've created for yourself than the life you were living. Yeah, totally. I mean, this is... Uh... I can't imagine being that person anymore. It's just, uh, it's just very different. And, um, in addition to like the health component of not having all of those things, um, the other beautiful byproduct is freedom because I don't have, you know, I, it kind of put me onto like lots of different threads, which were useful in my life, like trying to be financially independent, which means like, having more income than your expenses are. So just fully understanding like what you spend and on what, um, some minimalism stuff where I was just like, I don't really need all of these things. And, um, one of my favorite movies, fight club, the, the line in that is one that I think about a lot, which is, um, what you own owns you. Mm. And, um, and if you have cars and houses and boats, and even if you can afford it, it's still, you still got to think about it. You still got to maintain it or pay somebody else to maintain it. And so, you know, that concept of like, when you have nothing, you're out, you're totally free. And, um, so I've since then played around with like, like me and my wife and three kids have spent time sort of traveling and living just in Airbnbs with nothing apart from what we could fit in one car. That's it. Um, and, uh, now we've, and then we went through like, oh, well, we need, you know, a steady location for the kids. So we bought a house again and, recently sold that. But anyway, I think, um, after that whole initial piece, we've always been very conscious about consumption and like, what is, what are the things that are important to us? Because we know that creating memories are things that last forever. And, um, you know, buying things on Amazon and watching them pile up, a, a fleeting fleeting moments. Right. So it's very being very deliberate about what we bring into our lives. And, um, and I think, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the book. It'll come back to me in a minute, but um, I read a book recently, which talks about the concept of um, how, like, if you work out what your hourly wage is, so let's say you make 20 bucks an hour or 50 bucks an hour, um, you can then equate when you buy, looking at buying something, if you're looking at buying a new set of AirPods and they cost 400 bucks, you can say, well, that's eight hours of my life. Is that a good trade? Eight hours of life energy for, you know, uh, a set of headphones and sometimes you might be, yeah, but if you're buying a new car and it's 50 grand, you might be like, well, that's <laughs> like weeks and months. Is it worth it? I don't know. For some people it might be, but it's just looking at something, you know, instead of just money, it's like, it's actually energy. It's your energy that you're trading every time. 
I love that as someone to use as a tool, right? To really evaluate, is it worth it? And then what's even behind that paycheck, right? Like, do you have to work 80 hours a week to get that income to buy that thing? And is that, that's not time freedom at all. And that's going to be creating such anxiety and stress in someone's life if they don't have time with their family or their friends or even for themselves to go work out. So there's a lot behind that purchase um, that people need to consider. But this is such an impressive story um, because there's such resistance to changing a lifestyle. And I think your type A personality benefited you because you're a go-getter achiever and you were determined to fix this part of your life, right? So you're like, I'm going in. I'm going hard. I'm making these changes. So that part of your personality helped. And a lot of the people I work with are that type A, high achieving, driven, ambitious people, which is a blessing and a curse. Mm. Um, it can get you to one point in your life, but it can really hurt you and harm you in other points. You have to put that energy in the right place. So instead of putting that ambitious energy to working a million hours a week and doing too many things at once and trying to impress people, put it towards taking care of yourself and mm. your mental health and your physical health. Um, this is this is for this is for for type A people listening, or this, is, this sounds really weird, but it's it's a blessing and a curse because it can take you down the wrong paths. But I'm I have the sort of um, good fortune, and it's not just intellect. It's because I'm not I'm not super smart. It's just a, a combination of like work ethic and personality and 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 trying hard and all those things. But I'm pretty good at most things I do, and and that's great because it means you can be successful at things but it's also bad because you can be successful at things which aren't good for you and you've spent years going down a path where you're like oh tim's really good promotion promotion on you go and then you're like you know that so it's it's not all upside but when i switch that focus from career only to health and, and nurturing myself that you know it was the right priority and still is the same priority which is like me first in terms of uh take care of myself and then i'm a better dad and better husband better for everybody that I come across in the world. And, and it also happens that I love to help people. That's my sort of love language, if you will. So everybody gets, everybody else gets lots of me as well. But, you know, I'm, I have to prioritize that, you know, taking care of me before anything else. Totally. You know, I have a client that I really adore working with. And she made a statement like, there's a promotion available to me at work. And my automatic default is to go for it without even thinking of how this impacts any other area of my life. And, you know, we have to consider that. Are we just conditioned as type A overachievers to keep keep going and not knowing our boundaries, not knowing our limits, just thinking um, taking the next step on the ladder is what we're supposed to do? Or are we really cho making that choice from our own values, what aligns with us, what feels good for us? Sometimes we're just conditioned to push, push, push. And we do it and then we're like, why am I even here? I don't even want this. This doesn't even line up with where I'm at. I'm just doing it because I feel like I have to because I feel like it's the next step and I'm conditioned to just go, go, go. And I thought that was such great insight that this client had that a lot of people can relate to. Like, how do I pull back and stop? Can I make a choice out of what I'm valuing or am I making choices out of conditioning and habits from my past? Yeah, and my, my dad, um, who I love dearly and I got loads of, beautiful uh traits and attributes from but programming wise as a child um career was a thing you know my dad would phone me up and the first thing he'd say was how's work going and he'd be like oh your, your brother just got promoted you know and i'd be like wow that's really cool that rich got promoted and i guess i need to work harder so i knew that that was currency right that was value that was attention that was love ultimately when i speak to my father i'm like guess what dad i got promoted it's like the the ultimate validation they give me a bottle of champagne it's a wonderful thing mm -hmm. so that's w w where that drive came from it's very natural and now it makes me wonder and and re reflect on how i speak to my own children to see if i'm perpetuating or breaking the cycle and and what is the right thing to say what, what you know it's difficult it's not easy like being encouraging whilst not being too leading with like expectations around what they do with their lives is is tough to navigate right but just i think step one with all this stuff for me is just awareness are you aware of what you're saying how it's being perceived and or how it might be perceived and, and just you know continuing to consider Yes. You know, Tony Robbins has this exercise he does with 
people that, and he asked them two questions. Growing up, which parents' love did you crave? Not who loved you more, whose love did you crave, and who did you have to become or be to get that love? And it gives people a lot of insight of that dynamic between a parent where we were rewarded or seen for certain things. And for a lot of people, and it's so, um, it's harmless from a lot of parents, right? We, we praise our kids for certain things. We want, we think that's helping them and in, in being their cheerleader. But a lot of times we're praising achievement or overachievement. And that then creates this dynamic where a child's like, oh, to be, to be, feel loved by this person, I have to perform to a certain level mm-hmm. or I have to become this or that. And I think it's such a great exercise for people to question themselves. And like, who did yeah. you have to become to feel love from some parents that you were seeking the love from? Um, but this is all so helpful. I'm really appreciative of you sharing all of this. Um, before we had to wrap up, What's mm. one small thing someone can do today after listening that can help them manage their anxiety or take them in a direction where they can start to manage their anxiety better? Yeah, so I, ca- I kind of have a little thing I use in the moment, which I'll run through briefly. Um, I call it the three C's. And so if you're feeling anxious, I had this the other day, last week, feeling anxious in my stomach, felt kind of weird. And so I went through my own process. I actually have people who've tattooed this on their wrist. And uh, I used to encourage people to write three C's on their wrist, basically with a pen. So that if you're having a struggle, you can look down your hand and and go through the process. But some couple of people tattooed it, which I thought was interesting. But anyway, the first C stands for curiosity. So again, you'll be in your own investigator. Where is this coming from? Is it because, oh yeah, I did go out drinking last night. Maybe it's that. So you're looking for clues as to why you feel the way you feel. I just had an argument with my mum or my best friend, or just got fired from my job. Sometimes they're obvious things that we don't connect because we're in it. Um, and so that's that. The second thing is courage. And the courage means to stand in anxiety and sit there and feel it and embrace it and lean into it. Because one thing I know for sure in my experience is that if you try and hide from it, it will chase you and it will, you know, as Liam Neeson said, it will find you. Um, because that's what anxiety loves is you you avoiding it, right? So the courage to stand there, to feel it, if you feel it and let it do its thing, it will pass quicker. Um, and then the third C is compassion. So don't beat yourself up over it. it. Happens to so many people. So many people, you know, experience it on a daily basis. And you, you know, in order to heal, you need to love yourself. Um, and you need to realize it's part of the process. And there was a time in my life where I thought I'll never improve. I'm going to be like this forever. And now, you know, there there isn't anything it holds me back from doing. And it gives me this wonderful gift to be able to share my story with other people and and um help people more, which is something I've always wanted to do. So maybe it was always destined to kind of be part of my life. So those are the three C's, curiosity, courage, compassion. I love that. I'm stealing that for my sessions tonight when I um, see my clients. That's amazing. Thank you so much. How can listeners find you and connect with you? Yeah. So um, I have a website, which is just anxietypodcast.com. My podcast is called The Anxiety Podcast. Um, There's a picture of my head with pink writing on it or something (laughs) um so yeah the anxiety podcast is on spotify apple i've done uh i don't know how many episodes now 470 i think wow Um, and going for about seven years and it i've got loads of personal stories and interviews with people um but just yeah i just put out stuff that i think is is useful and um and, and beneficial so yeah i will make sure i link your podcast in my my podcast show notes thank you so much for coming on today tim thank you for having me i really appreciate it Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.